Okay, hello everyone. My name's Dr. Kate McLean. I'm Associate Professor here at the Institute for Global Prosperity at University College London. And I'd like to offer you firstly a very warm welcome to the IGP, to UCL and kind of to London, albeit virtually. I know that we're joined from people all around the world today, which is very exciting. So please do say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from as well. It'd be really good to see, to see the range. Um, I'm Director of Education here at the IGP and I'm also convener of the MSc in Global Prosperity. So the order of events today is that in a moment I'll be introducing the IGP and why it's a unique kind of academic department that offers unique degrees. And then I'll be specifying what is covered in the MSc Global Prosperity before handing over to my colleagues, Dr. Ida Kubizewski, who is the convener of the Prosperity Planet and People MSc, and Dr. Onya Idoko, who is the lead for PI, Prosperity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. They will talk about their respective programs. And we are also joined by our excellent administrator, Ms. Ms. Francesca Harrison. And we've got two former students online as well. So we've got Amanda Kartikasari, who graduated from us from the uh, Prosperity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship degree. And we're also joined by Adam Yusuf bin Mohammed Redsa, who's another of our alumni, and he's going to talk about his experiences on the degree as well. I can also tell you that Amanda is now part of the IGP communications team and she's assisting on the call in that capacity as well. She'll also be managing the Q&A later in the session. So as I'm going along, please do put your questions in the chat box and you can also upvote any that are already there if there are, your queries have already been uh, covered. And I believe we're also running a Zoom poll to see which of the three programmes you're interested in. I think, I think my colleagues will get that going now. So if you could just, um, um, if, you, if you can just vote on which one that is. Um, okay, brilliant. Without further ado, I will move to the next slide. Okay, so as I said, I'll be introducing the Institute for Global Prosperity. So the IGP is unique among academic departments. You can see there that our main aim is to redesign prosperity for the 21st century. This is an extremely ambitious aim that we're going to change the way we conceive and run our economies. We're not just about doing the thinking, we're about doing the, the, the doing as well. And we're also going to rework our relationships with the planet. So our vision is to build a prosperous, sustainable global future that is underpinned by the principles of fairness and justice and allied to a realistic long-term vision of humanity's place in the world. So both in terms of our theorizing, our empirical work, and in terms of our policy impact, we've got, we've got big aims and big ambitions because I think you'll agree that the world has some big problems at the moment, some big challenges that we, we need to deal with. Um, prosperity isn't just about GDP. That's one of our main slogans, actually. That's one of our um, main foci is that there's more to prosperity than just improving GDP. And you can see our founder and director there, Professor Henrietta Moore, has a very clear quote in that regard. And we also want to fight inequality, promote social cohesion, safeguard the environment, provide social rights, and give people hope to the future, which is, again, we're, we're, we've got some big challenges there. Yeah. Now we're unique because we don't just explore these issues in theory. We are actively engaged in changing things for the better and that engagement influences our research and teaching. Yeah. So we're also unique because of our transdisciplinary approach to these challenges. Now I'm thinking that you may have heard of the term interdisciplinarity, that's um, um, quite common across academic departments. But transdisciplinarity is specific. We look at the challenges and bring experts together from different fields to focus on those challenges. Um, so we work together on real world issues to solve them. And that's a fundamental element of our research, of our impact on the world, and also of our teaching. Yeah. 
What brings us together is our recognition that we have to move on from orthodox ideas of economic growth and GDP in order to deal with those challenges. And in the slide that you can see there, you can, uh, we're illustrating the problem. Our economic models to date, orthodox and to a lesser extent heterodox economic models to date, um, are predicated, they're based on ideas of growth and consumption. Yeah, that's been the definition of prosperity, certainly in the late 20th century up to now. Yeah. So we need to move away from policy debates and theoretical debates that focus on improving people's lives by increasing economic growth and related to that increasing consumption. If I could have the next slide, please. So some of the problems that have come from that mainstream economic understanding of, of wealth and growth is extreme inequality. Um, there have been increases of, in inequality since about the 1970s that are exponential, and that's really increased sharply since the financial crisis in 2008. Um, there are various measures of this, but I think this graph from the Oxfam report from 2021 shows this very clearly, that the top 10% have vastly increased their share of income compared to the bottom uh, 50%. So at the moment, the top 10% have 76% of global wealth and the bottom 50% have only two. If I could show you a graph that showed the 0.1%, the top 0.1%, that, that would be even more disproportionate. Yeah. So that's one of our key challenges that involves rethinking the way that we think about prosperity or the economy or well-being entirely. Yeah? And that underpins all of our research and all of the master's programs that you'll be looking at today as well. Yeah. I could have the next slide. Another key challenge that we address in all our master's programs, but particularly the um, PPP, program that my colleague Dr. Ida Kubijewski will be talking to you about in a second, is the challenge that this, that this model of economic growth has presented to the climate as well. We live in a world where critical earth systems and planetary boundaries are being breached at an alarming rate because of that growth model, because of that model of consumption extraction that has underpinned notions of wealth up to date. Not only is this affecting the climate, but we're also seeing global pandemics that are, uh, this are coming from um, the breaching of planetary boundaries as well. Yep. So there are health challenges that expose the fragility of our economies and also related to inequality, ex expose how important it is to value the key workers who are doing the work to keep us all together in a world that shows that minorities are going to be most affected by the fallout from those growth models. Yeah. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Those huge challenges are interlinked. Those kind of interlinked challenges we can refer to as grand challenges, also wicked problems, which is a very nice turn of phrase. And what it means is problems that have so many different components and different perspectives that you can have on them that they're extremely difficult to deal with. Yeah. And that's the, our, our, the challenges that we pose ourselves and that we come together to deal with focus on those grand challenges. Yeah. So how do we best work with communities, policymakers, and diverse stakeholders to inclusively and equitably redesign the economies, economies societies, businesses, and environments that humanity needs for the 21st century? That's the way we approach these challenges. And we draw inspiration from diverse sources and have many ideas and ongoing projects targeted towards these challenges. But we certainly don't have all the answers. And that's where you come in, actually. That's why, why the students on our degrees are actively involved in our research and in developing responses to these challenges. And that's why we need each of you to help us to address these problems. Yeah. If I could have the next slide. So when you'll be joining the IGP, you don't just study with us, rather you join a community of like-minded individuals from professors and students to alumni and citizen scientists from around the world who are committed to making change. We expect you to actively participate in this community and to generate your own knowledge and solutions and to go out into the world to make change happen. 
whether you're working in policy, NGOs, as an entrepreneur or in established businesses, we expect you to become a leader and a change maker. And we expect to involve and support you in our alumni community beyond your year of formal study. Yeah. So in other words, if you take an MSc at the IGP, it's not just a single year, but this is the start of a long-term process. And again, that's what those challenges require. If I could have the next slide. So on all of our master's programmes, when you join us, you will learn some of the more cutting edge thinkers who are challenging current economic thinking and business models. So our own Henrietta Moore and Nikolai Minchev are at the, at the forefront of this. Uh, Professor Moore has really been establishing this line of work over decades and has been very influential. We also draw on works such as Tim Jackson's Prosperity Without Growth and Kate Roweth's Donut Economics, which are two high profile texts that you may have may have come across. We show you the theoretical background to those texts and build in how they can be that how they can form responses to the challenges that I've outlined as well. Next slide, please. We will also invite you to become involved with our ongoing research at the IGP and we work with citizen scientists around the world and from the UK. So we don't just work with academics, we don't just work with people within the university, but we reach out and train citizen scientists who are then involved in our research. And that is, as, as part of the master's programmes here, you'd see that process happen. Yeah. It's not just in the UK, if I could have the next slide. We also have programmes in Kenya, and the next slide, please. Lebanon. Around the world, really. There are a fair few programs in Asia and Latin America as well. And we also um, are very well networked. We have the Fast Forward 2030 uh, network of entrepreneurs who, again, are actively involved in these challenges and are change makers. So as part of your time at the IGP, you will have the chance to interact with entrepreneurs from this program to address those grand challenges and wicked problems from the ground up. Yep. Next slide. We expect you to draw on the deep experiences of our Prosperity CoLab research projects. So we have um, co-laboratories in London, in Kenya, in Lebanon, and we have research projects around the world. And the aim of those collabs is to work with citizens and stakeholders to develop and co-design new visions for prosperity. Yeah. So we have the Procol UK and we also have the London Prosperity Board that is actively involved in developing a prosperity index, so an alternative to GDP. In Lebanon, we have the Relief Centre. Um, that is looking at the age of mass displacement and how to speed up transitions to sustainable, prosperous, prosperous societies in that context of mass migration, often caused because of um, conflict and war. Yeah. Um, as I've mentioned, we have the Prosperity CoLab in Kenya, which is focused on environmental challenges and sustainable consumption. And that's led by my colleague, Professor Jacqueline McGlade. Yeah. And we have the Asia Prosperity Research Hub as well, yeah, which has just been recently launched. We have a number of scholars who are looking at prosperity in Asia from a range of perspectives, again, anthropology, economics, policy making, and they come together in a lecture series that's particularly focused on bridging the urban and rural divide. So when you join us, you will be able to draw on a wealth of expertise I cannot exaggerate how influential Professor Dame Henrietta Moore has been in this field. She's an anthropologist who has decades of experience working on these issues and has really de developed on the basis of her ground up research in the field, particularly but not uniquely in East, East Africa. She has developed the techniques that we use and highlighted the importance of participation in our research and that transdisciplinary approach that is problem focused but brings together uh, people from a range of different perspectives. You'll also meet my colleague, Christopher Harker, Dr. Christopher Harker, and he's deputy director of the IGP. His research focuses on the Middle East and he's particularly interested in finance and developing alternative 
um, alternative approaches and institutions of finance. And then director of education, that's me. My research is focused on Latin America and I look at the rise of the middle class in Latin America and challenges to urban governance as well, in particular violence and the informal economy there. Yeah. Um, we, we, are, we are many though, and you will be able to interact with people who have a range of different perspectives in terms of discipline and also regional foci as well. So I've listed a few here. This is not exhaustive. I would strongly suggest that you go on our website and look through the staff to see the kind of different um, fields of research they come from, the different problems they've tackled, and imagine how you might be able to interact them and, with them and the questions that you'd be able to ask them and discussions you'd be able to have if you joined us on one of our master's programs. So that's an overview of the IGP. I'd like to briefly talk about the um, specifically the MSC in Global Prosperity. Now we have three MSCs, uh, Global Prosperity, Prosperity Innovation and Entrepreneurship and Prosperity Planet and People. Um, I'm the convener of the MSC in Global Prosperity. Um, what we cover in the Global Prosperity M MSC are the big ideas in prosperity thinking. Yeah. So these are the theorizations of how we can move beyond those naive ideas of, of growth and economic consumption and start, start being able to value what we really value in our everyday lives as well. So happiness and well-being, planetary limits, these are things that we all know that we value and are manifestly being underestimated in the, um, in the, in the crises that we're currently facing as well. Yeah. But these things are very difficult to get into big ideas and crucially big measurements and indices of how to think about wealth and happiness in the word prosperity. Yeah. So you'll come to understand the critical history of economic growth and consumerism. So why that mainstream economic model would appear to have gone so, so wrong. And to specifically look at the impacts of colonialism and modernity, the ideas of development and how we can um, identify the roots of today's global challenges in those terms. So not just diagnose the current problems today in terms of we need growth, 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 but also to think about what other political, historical, social aspects have, we, do we need to engage with to be able to understand these challenges better and also to be able to come up with some solutions to them. You'll critically inter interrogate alternative approaches to researching and measuring prosperity. Although when we focus on the challenges, on the problems, which I, I think it's all too easy to do, we can forget that there are, there are a wealth of alternative approaches out there. So there are some very positive actions going on at local level and at national and regional level as well to try and address these problems that have been caused by focus on economic growth and so you'll be introduced to those alternatives you'll be able to critically interrogate them and that's where the theoretical framework comes in but you'll also be able to think about how that can influence your own actions and the ways that you might want to build alternative economies alternative businesses as a response to these problems yeah. so you'll study in-depth existing cases from around the world that illustrate the complexity of those challenges but also successful pathways to prosperity. And that includes the IGP's own research projects. So that's the Prosperity Co-Labs in Lebanon, in Kenya, in London, and our research around the world as well. Yeah. You will learn about, um, about methods and practices for engaging and co-designing new futures with communities and stakeholders. Yeah. Participation is at the center of our approach. It's there are specific techniques involved in making participation successful and you'll engage with that across the course of the masters as well. Yep. Have the next slide. So this is the shape of the MSC in global prosperity. This is the overall structure. Um, you'll take four core modules. So you'll look at the theoretical modules, as I've explained there, Pathways to Prosperity 1, Global Legacies in Term 1. And then you'll build that on that in Term 2 by looking at global futures. So we look at the, the, the theoretical challenges behind the problems, 
And then in term two, we get a bit more positive and look at global futures and the solutions to those challenges. Yeah. And then in term one, you look at the um, different measures. I've mentioned it a few times, the different ways of measuring new ideas of prosperity. Yeah. And then again, in term two, you look at methods for actually solving. Once we've, we've got a good idea of the problem by getting the measurements right and the diagnosis right, we look at the methods for solving those problems. Yeah. You'll also take optional modules. You'll have two optional modules from a range of possibilities um, from the researchers who are at the IGP. Yeah. So we, we run research led modules on our specific areas of research. And so you'll have a window into that research process and also cutting edge ideas yeah, at the world le leading university. That's the, the basis of our modules and what underpins them. Yeah. And you'll be able to write a dissertation um, that will be your unique contribution to knowledge. Uh, the dissertation is a big undertaking, but it's a very satisfying undertaking. This is where you can find your voice throughout the material that, that we um, engage you with during the course, but you'll find your, your unique perspective on these issues and what you can add in terms of potential solutions, conceptually, practically, and in terms of policy. Uh, we also have, so that's the, that's the full-time, typical full-time schedule, but we also have part-time and module flexible options as well. So can I go to the next slide? The overall shape of the degree is that in the first term, we introduce you to the, the, the problems, the challenges, the um, wicked problems, as I said before, but we, we introduce you to those different critical ways of looking at them. How can we get the diagnosis right? The diagnosis is that we lack growth. So we look at the measurements and the theories that offer alternative ways of diagnosing those challenges. And then in term two, we get a lot more positive and we look at um, the different ways that you can um, address those challenges as well. And then, as I said, you get the, the dissertation is a big chunk of the degree really. It's, um, it's um, a, a real opportunity for you to make your mark on those big challenges. Next slide, please. We do offer scholarships, both directly from the IGP and also from the Bartlett more broadly. Um, the, these, are, these scholarships are very good. They're very competitive, but they are very good. Um, Often you need to have been admitted to the degree in order to apply for the scholarship. So if you do want to apply for one of those scholarships, get your application in early. But we have a range um, of scholarships for different areas of the world, for different people. And I'd, I'd suggest that you look at the criteria and see which ones that you can apply for. They are competitive, but they'd be very prestigious and worth having if you were able to get them. Yeah. And next slide. And I want to emphasize that it's not just the classes that you take when you come to do a master's at the IGP. We have a broad range of activities, research led activities, teaching activities, uh, opportunities to get involved with the, with the impact that we're having on the ground as well. So you'd be strongly encouraged to come to all of the, the events that we offer and that will add a valuable element to the degree that you're doing as well. Yeah. So we have a program of speaker events with invited leading guest academics and practitioners. So again, it's, it's, we, we're unique in that we're really engaged with the real world. Yeah. You have personal leadership and professional skills training, which includes transferable prosperity and impact measure, measurement skills. Yeah. So the skills that you learn specifically about prosperity can be transferred to other policy areas as well, yeah? as with the transferable writing and digital communication skills. Yeah? You will have peer support from our expanding global collaborative and alumni co community, and you'll also have opportunities to work with remarkable partners and projects around the world. Yeah? So these degrees will provide you with a real opportunity to develop your own way of making a difference. So your own informed theoretical voice on these problems and also real ways where you can do something good and put something good back into the world in terms of addressing those challenges. Okay, I believe that I will now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Ida Kowajewski. 
But thank you very much for listening. And as I said, please do put in the chat any questions that you may have for later in the Q&A so that we can respond then. Okay, I'll hand over to you, Ida. Thank you. Um, hi, all. Um, my name is Ida Kuszewski, as Professor McLean has said, um, and I'll be leading the Prosperity People and Planet um, master's degree. Um, so just a bit of background on me. Um, I would consider myself an ecological economist, um, and you'll see some of that terminology come through as I talk about the Prosperity People and Planet. Um, MSc. Also, apologies. Um, I do have COVID right now. So if my voice goes a little bit, um, that is why. So apologies about that. Um, okay, so the conventional view we'll talk about in this master's program, we'll talk about basically the differences between the conventional view and more ecological economics view, or more of a prosperity um, perspective. And so with the conventional view, the economy nature and society are usually considered as three independent um, aspects that talk to each other in some way. While we look at it as basically three um, embedded systems. So the economy system is part of the society system, and which is part of the environment system. And you can't consider those all independently. They have to be looked at um, together as one whole big system. Um, a very complex system, but one whole big system. Um, and so any problems that are analyzed and any solutions that are developed to that system have to incorporate all three of those perspectives. And we focus a lot about on the ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are the benefits that nature provides to us. And they're critical, not only in providing sort of raw materials and food, but also help with our mental health, physical health, and a lot of other um, benefits. So then how do ecosystem services play within that big, in complex system. Um, how do we incorporate them? How do we incorporate them into the economy? How do we value them? How do we ensure that they are considered within any decisions we make through policy or businesses? And also, how do we look at the trade-offs? So how do we put them into the same language as we do with all our other decisions? Um, and we look at how the ecosystem services then interact with a lot of the other capital. So build capital is anything humans build um, and create. Human capital is everything about ourselves, our education, um, and social capital is our relationships and how those then interact to create sustainable human well-being and prosperity, basically. So how do we bring that all together? Um, we also look at various frameworks. So Professor McLean mentioned um, Tim Jackson and Kate Rayworth, um, and those are two guest speakers that would probably come in to the course and give lectures on their different um, frameworks. And we'll talk about their two frameworks. So this one is um, created by Kate Rayworth. Um, and it's looking at basically the fact that if you have planetary boundaries, environmental planetary boundaries, you also need to have a social foundation and a social floor that that can't drop too far below um, because then people's basic needs aren't met. So we have to look at this from different ways. And then how does the economy enable all of that, both the ecological ceiling and the social foundation? Um, and we look at the sustainable development goals, which I hope all of you have heard of at this point, and how those one interact with the other frameworks, but then also looking at the fact that these are ending in about seven years, eight years now, and have to be replaced by something else. And so leading up to that ending, what does that mean for the sustainable development goals? What, how, what have they accomplished? What haven't they accomplished? And how we move them forward. We also look at how all this will work with 
the understanding that there are tipping points, environmental tipping points around the world. So we know that, for example, the Greenland ice sheet is melting. But what does that actually mean for the planet, for society, for the economy? Um, and how do we know where that is? Um, will it melt tomorrow? What would that mean? Will it melt in 50 years? What will that mean? And then what is the resilience of the societies we have built to sustain some of these major environmental tipping points? Can our economy handle one of these actually going over um, one of these tipping points? So we kind of look at these problems as a one big holistic system and see how they all interact with each other. We also look at metrics. Um, is there a way, way to measure all this? So in this case, we're looking at basically income on one axis and GPI on the other axis over time. And so this is GDP, global GDP over time. And this is genuine progress indicator, which is looking at an aspect of GDP, but adjusted. And we find that, whoops, wrong way. And we find that a lot of this difference is that when GDP has grown, um, well-being or a version of well-being has not grown. And a lot of it is due to the cost of environmental damage and the cost of inequality. So what does that mean for humanity? What does that mean for us going forward? And it's as Herman Daly mentioned, um, when they're both growing together, it's economic growth. And then on the right here, when they're not growing together, it's uneconomic growth, which means that the economy is growing, but uneconomically, because where the growth is, is from things that we don't actually want to grow. So GDP grows when there's an oil spill or a cyclone um, that hits land. And yet that's nobody would say that's a positive thing. And so how do we distinguish positive and negatives? And then how do we actually measure it? And we'll go through a lot of different metrics and indicators and look at why hasn't the world adopted one yet? Um, is there one that it should adopt? Why not? So a lot of what this master's program will talk about is looking at solutions to our dire global problems, as Kate said, wicked problems, um, and how, how do we solve them? What are the potential solutions? How do we look at the system in a different way that allows us to look at the problems and the solutions and not just the problems? We also look at scenario planning. So we look at how do we design the future? Is there techniques and ways to envision and then design the future and then work on actually making that happen? So this is, for example, one scenario planning exercise done in the past. And you have, you know, which future would you want to live in? What if you asked your next door neighbor, which future would they want to live in? How do we make that happen? How do we design it and then actually implement it? And so that's a lot of the things we'll talk about. And so um, I love this comic because a lot of times, you know, people say, well, let's get energy independence, um, preserve rainforest, sustainability, green job, et cetera. And there's always somebody asking, okay, but what if it's, this is a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Let's create a better world. Let's learn how to create that better world. And let's learn how to implement that better world. Um, and so the primary lectures into this program will be myself and um, Professor Robert Costanza. Professor Robert Costanza is the father of ecological economics. He started the field um, and will be teaching us. And then there will be others that will be teaching into it. But the idea behind this master's degree is to basically look at complex systems, look at the interactions between the whole system. So the economic, social, political, ecological processes. How do we measure and model those? Um, and then how do we put those into policy and into decision making on both businesses, nonprofits, governments going into the future and looking into the future? Um, so this 
master's program is set up into same as the GP program has basically four core courses. One provides you, introduces you to the frameworks and measures that are out there. Um, and then it looks at different research methods that allow you to actually start understanding how to incorporate the whole system together. We look at how do you design a future? And then this is a very hands-on atelier. So we'll partner the class up with somebody on the ground. Could be somebody local from London, could be an international partner and have them provide a big complex problem, which the students with us and other faculty work together on trying to solve. Um, so it's trying to very much apply what we learn in these three other courses, um, very much looking to apply that um, to a hands-on experiment um, as a way to learn. And then a dissertation where you can take all this information basically, um, and apply it in a really interesting and unique way to something that you're critically interested in. You'll have the option of taking two optional modules, which could be from the other programs at IGP or elsewhere, um, in a way to supplement and complement what you've already learned. Um, so, and then, so one thing I do want to mention before um, I give it back to Professor McLean um, is that what we're looking to do is introduce you to a different way of thinking. And so when you go graduate and go to find jobs, you bring with you a whole complex understanding of how the system works and how to find solutions within that system. So thank you. Brilliant. Many thanks, Ida. Excellent. I will now hand over to Dr. Anya Idoko, if she's there, who will take, take you through the, the, the MSc in Prosperity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Over to you, Anya. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Ida. Let me just share my screen. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Onya Idoko, and I'm co-program leader for the MSc in Prosperity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship. I'm a lecturer in PI, and I'm one of the leads for the Asia Prosperity Hub, which um, Kate mentioned earlier. Today, I will talk about what you will learn on the PI program, how you will learn, and I'll share a few tips on the application process. Um, the MSE and PI will lead you to an impactful career and is well suited for budding social entrepreneurs, for those wishing to challenge and change social values and missions within established businesses, or for those that are looking to engage with businesses and entrepreneurs, either through policy, governments, or working um, as part of an NGO. So I will look at the, I'll introduce you to the team. So I've talked about myself and I lead the program with my colleague, Con, Dr. Conrad. Um, Conrad is also the departmental graduate tutor. We also have associate lecturer, Ms. Mara torres Penedo. Mara is one of our um, final year PhD students. And then we also have Francesca, who's part of the team. Move on. Then you'll also be working with some of our PGTAs, so the postgraduate teaching assistants. We have Pete, Carmen, Natalie, and then you'll work with some of the IGP affiliates, so Vega, um, Dr. Tuka Toivonen, and you'll meet them in uh, in your classes. And I'll, I'll come back to Solvega and Tuka in a bit. So Kate talked us through um, some of the problems, and Ida mentioned them as well. And we live in a world where we're faced with complex social and environmental problems, such as the humanitarian crisis that we see. And these conflicts have caused disruptions at social, economic, and psychosocial levels, just to name a few. When we consider the impact, so if you think about the impact of the pandemic as well, 
it not only created, so a lot of what Kate and Ida talked about, you'll see that the pandemic exacerbated many of these things. And, and it not only, not only created a health crisis, but it also exposed um, the fragility of our economies and how interconnected we are. So a lot of these challenges and problems, as Kate already mentioned, are interrelated. So for example, the recent floods in Pakistan, which has put many in precarious positions, such as um, increased food insecurity and poverty. Um, and because of this interrelatedness, so you can see the environment and social issues coming to clashing, because of this interrelatedness and complexity, all of this is captured within that word that Kate used, which is grand challenges and wicked problems. And when you think about these sort of problems, so for example, one definition of grand challenge, is it's complex, it's multidimensional, multi-level challenges. And these sorts of challenges require unconventional approaches and solutions. They require collaborative approaches that involve different actors from the public, private, non-profit, and from within society. So, how do we engage or on this MSC pie, we sort of, we approach these problems um, by focusing on entrepreneurship, focusing on how entrepreneurs can address the challenges that we've just mentioned and how we can rethink the role of business and entrepreneurship in making or creating the type of change that we'd like to see in society. So this raises a couple of questions for the entrepreneurs. How do we, these are questions that we will look at on the program. How can transformative entrepreneurs discover, define and pursue opportunities that catalyze the types of transformative social and environmental changes that are needed? How do we innovate to address these issues? What forms of organizing or business models are needed to tackle these issues? How do different structures such as governance structures, processes, and practices enable or hinder innovations that are aimed at addressing these complex social and, and environmental problems? How can entrepreneurs access, combine, and use resources in innovative ways to pursue opportunities that drive the kind of change that you already heard about, that Ida and Kate already talked about? What sort of resources or means can you utilize in order to start a transformative enterprise? And what roles do indigenous innovations play in tackling complex social and environmental problems? So these are some of the questions that we'll consider when you join us. And by the end of the program, you will not only have a better understanding of these issues, but you will have the tools and frameworks to take action in practice. And this will come from drawing on the collective intelligence of the IGB community. So remember, Kate was talking about the community. So what will you learn on the program? I already touched on some of this. So as an IGP student, you'll be a part of the thriving community that offers a variety of opportunities, both within and outside of your class. Um, and you'll learn from leading scholars who are at the cutting edge in their fields and from IGP affiliates, both academics and practitioners such as Tuca and Solvega and other um, affiliates that will join us in our classes. So you learn about a range of topics, um, for example, rethinking innovation to theories and concepts such as effectuation, which is an entrepreneurship theory, um, community-based enterprises. So we'll look at a case study um, of a CBE, which is the community-based enterprise um, based in Tibet. And we're gonna analyze that through a case study and pull out some of the principles that you can take or use if you were to start a community-based enterprise. Um, we'll also examine different organizing models and their consequences in relation to some of the social and environmental issues we already talked about and will work towards developing an understanding of transformative entrepreneurship. So you'll develop the key research skills. You'll also develop research skills that will enable you to conduct impactful research on and for transformative entrepreneurship. 
um, and research that has a real impact on society and the environment. And so now I will move on to talk about what um, you already heard. So for GP and um, PPP, but for PI, it's very similar in terms of the structure. You will have two core modules in term one, and then you have the opportunity, which I think is fantastic for you to choose an optional module, 15 credits, that gives you 45 credits in term one. You can choose a module from across UCL. It can be from planning. It can be from the School of Management. It can be from anthropology. And then in term two, you have two, two core modules again and the option to choose a 15 credit module. That's 45, that gives you 90 credits. And then in term three, you have the dissertation module, which is a 90 credit module, and that takes you to 180 credits in total. And in your dissertation module, which is where you undertake that um, independent research, you will, of course, be assigned a specialist personal supervisor, and you'll have your personal tutor as well to guide you through that process. So in terms of the intellectual uh, structure of the program, each term, you'll notice that each term has a theory module and a core practical methods module. Um, in term one, you'll learn theories and concepts that lay the foundation for term two and your dissertation module. So in T1, you'll take uh, transformative entrepreneurship and prosperity core concepts. And here you'll learn about theories of transformative entrepreneurship. You'll consider theoretical lenses that are useful for understanding how entrepreneurship could possibly be transformative. Um, you'll also take the research methods module where you'll learn about research methods, qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods, when to use them, how to use them. Um, and this of course includes um, approaches such as ethnography, interviews, visual methods. And then in term two, you'll take the transformative entrepreneurship and prosperity design module, which is where you're starting to think about um, how do you design a transformative enterprise? Um, so this is a how, how type module. Um, and you'll look at processes of creating such an enterprise. You'll learn about problem solution, um, definition and fit, funding, pitching, business model design, and commercialization. And then you have the connected innovation projects module, which is a practice-based module where you have a combination of in-class sessions and your work on an innovation project. This is led by my colleague, Dr. Conrad. Um, you'll have the option to work on a project with a startup, an enterprise, or a nonprofit organization, or you can work on a research project that is already ongoing within the IGP. You can also propose a project of your own, um, working with an organization in the UK or abroad. So that's the intellectual architecture. A quick mention. As a part of PI, you will have the opportunity to access the support and resources provided by UCL's innovation and enterprise team. Um, they offer various opportunities for students, which I encourage you to take advantage of. They have, uh, a, they have an incubator, which is called the Hatchery. You have a chance to meet the entrepreneurs that are already based within the Hatchery. And if you have an idea, depending on the stage of the idea, you could also uh, be based in the hatchery and, pro and access that one-on-one -on -one support that they provide. Then I want to touch on fast forward 2030 because it's also critical for the PI students. You'll be able to engage with these entrepreneurs on fast forward 2030, um, which is a global network based in the UK, Lebanon and Kenya, and it's also expanding to other parts of the world. And fast forward 2030 was formed in 2015 by um, our director, Henrietta Moore and Arthur Kay who's the founder of BioBean and Skyroom. And um, you get a chance to engage with them in class. So you saw so Vega, who's here, um, author, they will also be in class with us. So that's the end of my presentation. And now I will share a few tips on, um, on the application process. Some of the key things that I wanna mention, and I think uh, Francesca will touch on, if you're a scholarship holder, if you do get awarded a scholarship, I advise you to please contact us immediately and let us know. For your personal statement, please make sure that you are clear and you address the question that's been asked of you. For your references, 
make sure that these references are coming from institutional, um, so with like two academic references, ensure that your references use their institutional email addresses and no personal addresses, because these are some of the little issues that cause delays. So I will stop there and hand over back to Kate. Let me see if I can just... Those really were excellent tips on application as well. That's very important, everything that Anya just said there. Thank you. Okay, I think we're now handing over to Amanda and Adam so they can talk about their experiences on the programs. Okay, Amanda, would you like to go first? Yep. Okay. Thank you. you. So, thank you, Kate. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda. I was a PI student in the 21-22 cohort, and I came here to the Chevening Scholarship. Um, so I came from a business management background. My bachelor's degree focused on entrepreneurship. I also had a fashion entrepreneurship background, specifically in the wedding industry. It wasn't hard working as a female entrepreneur in the sector because the industry is huge. But when I wanted to move my business towards sustainable practices, I faced challenges. First, the market awareness is low, and second, there is a lack of entrepreneurial ecosystem in the sector to support my journey. So I had to learn about sustainable fashion and at the same time enhance my capability as an entrepreneur. I pitched my idea with a poorly made business plan and hadn't gotten a response anywhere. There was a lack of available resources in, in, in Indonesia. So I know I had to study abroad and the UK is definitely the place to learn about fashion, sustainability and entrepreneurship. I chose London specifically because it's a melting pot for diverse entrepreneurs from all over the world. I compared a few courses related to innovation and entrepreneurship because I knew that innovation is one of the keys to thriving. But I wanted to know more about innovation in the realm of impact businesses on a larger scale, and that's why I chose the Institute of, for Global Prosperity. My one year at the IGP as a PI student taught me to be critical, examining prosperity and innovation in the context of my country and particularly in my respective field. Onya's class, Transformative Entrepreneurship and Prosperity Core Concept challenged me to really think about whether solving the textile waste problem can really make Indonesian society prosper. Is creating social impact really the one thing that will attract the market partners and investors? So I get to know these things and I'm lucky enough to be team up with my group in term two to use the problem solving framework and pitch a social enterprise idea, which turns out to be the mature version of what I wanted to do back then. And that experience in addition to my extracurricular at UCL Innovation Enterprise that Onya mentioned, um, allowed me to exercise pitching and actual competition with real grant money, as well as my dissertation, researching the Indonesian sustainable fashion entrepreneurial ecosystem has taught me so much. I can reflect on my lesson, um, on the lesson learned and develop myself as a person, as a professional and entrepreneur. So I hope that helps you to decide whether this program is right for you. And I'd be happy to answer your question later or through Francesca, the program administrator. So um, thank you and back to Kate. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'll hand, hand over to Adam, if he's there. Hi, Adam. Hi. Um, so my personal background was um, similar to Amanda's in that I did business management for my undergraduate as well. I did it at Queen Mary, and after that, I decided that I wanted to immediately do a master's to not only specialize in a topic that I was passionate about, but also to uh, to get at least a certain niche and a certain positions uh, more specifically, rather than just the general skills and the general positions that business management uh, would have afforded me at the time. Um, my experience with IGP was in incredible and entirely positive, as it it opened me to a lot of networking opportunities, not only within the cohort, but also outside of it. As um, Anya and Ida have explained, there's a lot of uh, opportunities during the course that you can take both as an optional thing as well as compulsory. Um, the cohort were all super supportive and all from various backgrounds, many of them having worked for decades in either in governments, NGOs, big firms, or even some of them in the UN. And, not only were they ready and willing to share the insights, but they were incredibly supportive of everything and they were just lovely to be with at all times. Um, currently, I am uh, looking for a job in environmental, environmental consulting as afforded to me by the 
the opportunity I've had at IGP. Um, all the modules and lessons have taught me things that I would not have even known about beforehand, such as bigger systems thinking and just rethinking prosperity outside of economic development and outside of GDP, really focusing on the environmental standards of the planet as well as um, as well as prosperity in terms of happiness and people's education. Uh, I have to say the skills that really stood out to me and I think have really helped me shine um, was the transdisciplinary research process. Before I had only learned about research methods through my undergrad and had not even touched into interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary research and learning all about transdisciplinary research where not only do you do a multitude of uh, different skills all pulled into one and different specialities, but also the research itself leads to an active outcome that can contribute while you're researching. That was really, really special to me and just kind of blew my mind a little bit. Um, I have to say that overall, the one advice I'd have for those thinking to apply to IGP specifically, which is what, um, which is what I did, um, the, global prosperity specifically, is that to be, to really focus on your passion, not only for, for what you want to specialize in, but also like how you want to contribute to the planet, uh, to the planet and to the earth as well. That's what really helped me, I think, choose um, IGP and UCL over other master courses, as I really felt that UCL and IGP were there to do something different and to really help the planet rather than to try the same old things that while are helpful may not contribute as significantly as trying something new. Yeah. That is fantastic, Adam. Thank you both. Thank you, Amanda and Adam for that. That, that is really fantastic advice about going with your passion, actually. Like, and that really is our approach as well. We want to draw your, out your interests and your voice and your experiences and bring them into dialogue with the kind of work that we do so that you can make that unique contribution. Okay, I think we're handing over to Miss Francesca Harrison. Now, if you're here, Francesca is the beating heart of the entire <laughs> operation, actually. You will, you will get to know Francesca well over the application process, but I, th I think you've got some advice on how to apply and various other issues. Yep, so I'll hand over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yep, so I'm Francesca Harrison. I'm the Senior Teaching and Learning Administrator at the IGP. Um, and I just want to, I'm, I'm pleased to say that all of our MSc programmes are now live for application. So there was a slight delay with the MSc Prosperity, People and Planet, but that is now open. And uh, Vicky has kindly put the link to that in the prospectus in the chat um, in this talk. Um, so yes, please do go if you want to apply. Uh, they are all open. Applications for all the MSc programmes will close on the 30th of June 2023. However, although that's when they close, we do encourage students to apply as early as possible, especially if you are also applying for scholarships and funding. Uh, so moving on to scholarships and funding, there are a few that I'd like to highlight to you. Um, all of this information that I'm about to run through very briefly is also on the IGP Funding Your Studies uh, webpage, which I'll add a link in the chat to in just a moment. So don't worry about having to write down all of these deadlines. They are on a web, a web page for you to go and have a look at. Um, so the first one I'd like to highlight is the IGP Equity Fund. Uh, so there are two um, scholarships available worth £5,000 each towards tuition fees. Um, all the details about this are again on the IGP Funding Your Studies page. And the deadline to apply for that, that fund is the 31st of May 2023. Um, another one I'd like to highlight to you is the Bartlett Promise Master's Scholarship. So this is full tuition fees plus an allowance um, to cover living costs and study expenses. Uh, there are 10 scholarships available each year for this. Um, the, some of the deadlines haven't been uh, published yet for 23-24, but I'll give you an idea of when they're likely to, um, to open and end. Uh, so that scholarship usually opens around March uh, and then closes around the end of May. Um, another one to highlight is the Bartlett, Bartlett Promise Sub-Saharan Africa Master's Scholarship. So again, this is for full um, overseas tuition fees and an allowance. Uh, there are four scholarships available um, for, the, for September 2023, uh, and these are for students from um, an approved list of Sub-Saharan African countries. And if you go to the webpage, you'll see all the information about that one. And the, they will, that will open on the 15th of February and will close on the 31st of March 2023. 
Uh, there's also the UCL master's bursary. This is uh, worth £10,000 for one year. Um, and the deadline for that is usually around early June. There's also the UCL Global's Ma Global Masters uh, Scholarship, uh, and that is a £15,000 for one year. Uh, again, this deadline is usually around mid-May. And the final one I just want to highlight, which is important because the deadline is very close, is the Chiefling Scholarship. Um, and the deadline for this is the 1st of November 2022. So it's very, very close. If you want to apply for that one, please make sure that you get your admissions application in as well as your scholarship application. Um, and that I will add the links to the IDP funding your studies page to the chat. I'll also send a link to the UCL scholarships finder, which we, you can search for all UCL scholarships. Um, so you're able to go and have a look at all the details there. Um, and that is all from me for the moment. Brilliant. Thank you, Francesca. And I think now we're going to the Q&A. But I think Amanda... How, how should we do it, Amanda? Should we read oh. out? I can see some questions have been answered already. But... I can read up and direct the questions um, for you, Ida or Onya or Adam. So yeah, let me start. Um, so first we have a question from anonymous attendee. I believe this, um, this is directed to Francesca who can help to answer. What kind of bachelor's qualifications are eligible to apply for the three MSc programs offered by the IGP? Francesca. Um. Okay, can you see me? Um, I think actually this might be better to go to our admissions tutors for their respective programmes, if that's all right. Maybe if we could start with the MSC GP. Is that all right, Kate? There's a range. I, th I, think, I think Anya will have a lot of insight in this, but there is a range of uh, bachelor's qualifications. You generally need a 2-1. I can see there are uh, questions about alternative qualifications and work experience that can count as well that we'll get to. Um, but typically our students come from everything from uh, social science, so sociology, politics, history, business and economics, um, finance. Uh, it's also possible to apply with a natural science degree. Um, and what, we, what, what we're looking for really is in the applications process is a commitment to, the, to rethinking prosperity. So it's not a standard development studies economics degree. What we're looking for is that commitment. And so that can really come from a range of different undergraduate programs. Um, I don't know, Anya, do you want to add anything about that, about the range of subjects that are no, Kate, you, 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 you covered it perfectly. Um, so for example, on Pi, we have a variety of backgrounds. We have engineers, we have accountants, um, and that we have a dentist. That kind of enriches um, the group work. And, and Amanda might even maybe touch on that later on, but everyone brings these um, backgrounds and experiences together. And that that's what helps them with the group assignments that enriches their dissertations and the experience. So Kate covered it all. Um, can I just then touch on the application process? So it's not necessarily about the background per se. It's really um, aligning with the program that you're applying for. And that has to come through in the personal statement in the experiences that you've had, which is in your CV, which we'll see, um, that also could potentially your 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 background helps as well. So, for example, if you've come in from a business school, or you have a policy background, or you have, for example, an anthropology background. So, I have a student who's from anthropology at the moment. All of that helps, not just one single thing for example. So it's the whole picture that we're looking at. I, ho I hope that answers the question. Definitely the answers. Um, Aida, do you have anything to add about the PPP program related to the bachelor's qualification? Um, so I think we're pretty open. So we don't go in depth 
um, into economics, into any of these issues to the point where, where you would need a background in economics or a specific back, bachelor's background. Um, so anything you need to know about economics will kind of cover during the courses, um, and there will be an elective um, economics course if you want to go further into it. Um, our goal with any of this is to kind of create that interaction. So whichever um, bachelor's program you come in from, I think you'll be perfect joined to kind of interact with um, bachelor's um, students that are from quite different programs. And so we're looking for diversity. Um, and I think that's our primary goal um, because the more diverse you are, um, the more interesting the program will be both for you and for us. So thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I think it relates to the, to the next question um, that we have from Chaya Korn from Thailand. Um, um, it's asking whether GPA counts as a factor in, in applications consideration because um, Chaya Korn says that the undergraduate study is considered to be 2.2 in the UK system, which means that it's not meeting the entry requirement for the programs. Um, do you have any suggestions to this concern? I, I think I'll let Anya elaborate, but we do take into account work experience in the program as well. So whilst the normal demand is a 2-1, like, and that's normally a requirement, um, that can, in the personal statement, and we look at the application as a whole, we do take into account that work experience and volunteer experience if it's relevant, which, you know, we cast quite a broad net there. Is, is that do you have anything to add there, Anya? That, that's it, Kate. So again, it's first or upper second class, UK bachelor's degree equivalent. Um, but in addition to that, we would also be looking for evidence of extensive experience, um, which we might consider in lieu of the above. So it, 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 it's exactly as Kate described it. Okay, amazing. So I think the answers questioned, um, Chaya Korn does explain that he has uh, experience in innovation fields and volunteering works. So thank you. Um, the next question would be, how best can I explain my work experience as it's varied? What should be the structure for my CVs from Safir Malik? Um, I think I can help to answer this and maybe Adam, you can um, add to this. I think how I structured my CV is it's the same with how you would apply for a job, basically. Just um, relate your past experience and then relate it to the program that you are applying to. For example, um, for me, I highlighted my entrepreneurship experience. And for example, I worked in banking, which is not directly related to the program that I'm applying for. But then I just highlighted all the experiences and the lesson learned from that experience. So that, that was how I structured my CV. And since I was applying for entrepreneurship program, the first thing that I highlighted was my entrepreneurship experience and education comes first in the, in the top because I'm applying for academic um, degree. I'm not sure about Adam, do you have any tips on this? Um, to answer Xavier's question, as well as an earlier part of a question from an anonymous attendee about how they worked as a consultant, um, I, for anything that I couldn't fit in a, a one-page CV, I, I might have elaborated on in my personal statement, and if I'm not sure if you have heard of the STAR structure, which is the skill you got, the task that practiced that skill, the action you took in order to either develop or utilize that skill and then the result you got. And you can use that for anything. It might feel as if a general consulting experience would not be relevant in this degree, but I would actually very much disagree. I had, um, I had experience in operations consulting that was nothing to do with sustainability at all, but I explained a certain skill that I got from that uh, within my personal statement, as well as a brief summary of my experience. And um, that seemed to do the trick, so. Amazing, thank you, Adam. Um, 
we have a next question from Grace Henny. Um, I think I can answer this, but maybe Kate or Francesca can add later. So hi, I'm from Indonesia and exploring the UCL IGP courses for Chevening 2023 award program. I want to know whether UCL has received the Indonesian Chevening awards. Yes, I am Chevening scholar. And we do have Chevening scholars from other countries as well in the PI cohort and GP. Um, I, and then the next question is, I'm interested in a one year master's program in digital health or emergency response field. Anything you can share with us? I think Onya has mentioned that um, we do have lots of students from different backgrounds, so it won't matter um, what are you interested in. And I think you can al always take an, take an elective, related elective with your interests. Um, for me personally, I took um, an elective from behavioral science department and also from an anthropology department to complement what I am interested about. So it won't be a problem if you are um, applying for this program, but you are interested in a specific field. In fact, you may also find someone who is interested in that field as well. Um, Francesca, you want to add something? Uh, no, just to say that we had four uh, achieving scholars uh, in our last cohort. So just to let, add that number to the answer. Great. Yeah, we need that number. <laughs> and Maybe Adam, you would like to explain what, what what are your electives in the past year that you took? Um, since I was actually part of GP, um, one of my, the electives I took um, was taught by Anya and uh, compulsory for the Pi group, which was the uh, transformative entrepreneurship core concept. A really, really uh, lovely elective. Uh, sometimes I kind of wish I did Pi as well, but I'm really glad with GP. Um, that just taught how um, how entrepreneurship can transform and help society and it's uh, and be part of that wider system change within its own operations. Um, another elective I took was urban futures and prosperity and how urban spaces and how they're designed um, can really impact prosperity both for the better and for the worse and therefore it needs to be actively thought about and uh, brought to a conscious level not really done on the side because that can lead to a lot of um, consequences we, we won't foresee until much later and it's it, that could be incredibly detrimental and hard to change since it's an urban space. Both of these are were absolutely incredible and while rigorous really really rewarding they brought an angle that the compulsory modules I had touched on uh, and kind of they took it further than the compulsory ones could since they had to cover different um, topics. And it was just a really, really nice way of, of kind of rounding out your experience with it. Thank you. So no matter what your background or your interests, um, yeah, you can complement your experience with all the electives and perspectives from your cohort as well. Um, so we move on to the next question, which is if our grades and workload permitted, would it be possible to take an extra optional module? I believe Francesca can help to answer this. Um, you can't take an, op an, an extra optional module as part of your MSc program, because your MSc program is made up of 180 credits. And if you were to take a, another optional module, you would be going over those credits. Having said that, there have been a few occasions, and it, I would also add that it's not necessarily something to be encouraged just because the workload is quite intense. It's quite a challenging workload and you need to prioritize your core modules and your, your that make up part of your program. Having said that, there have been a few occasions in the past I'm aware of where students have been able to organize this. However, it, it, it couldn't be guaranteed. Um, you would need to, uh, it would need to be organized with whatever whoever the module is running the module it would also incur additional fees because it isn't part of your program it isn't part of the 180 credits that make up your program so i hope that answers the question perfectly thank you um we have the next question which is from reza Naufal. Hi, I'm from Indonesia, looking forward to studying IGP. I have heard about the collaborative approach of the Bartlett culture, and he would like to know how is the practice of that, um, because he's interested in collaborating with students from different programs um, from another school, other school or departments. 
um, my experience collaborating with other students, actually collaborating with students from my own cohort has been an amazing experience. So I get to like really collaborate with um, them in the in a group project. And also because I took an elective, then I would be able to actually collaborate with other students from other department, departments as well. That's why I think it's important to, to take an elective from other department if you want to do so. Um, for Adam, he um, took an elective from the IGP and I think he can also share his experience collaborating with other students. Have you got any experience in that, Adam? Um, Adam, yeah. Sorry. Cool. Um, admittedly, because of um, certain, like, uh, certain personal issues and uh, with where I lived and stuff like that, I couldn't, I couldn't engage with the uh, wider community, not only of Bartlett but also the cohort as much as I could. Um, however, within the courses and also the modules themselves, um, there was a lot of projects in which you had to collaborate with others, either formally for um, either a research project where you split the task between each other and you collaboratively decide actually what topic you want to focus on as well, it was very uh, free form like that, as well as um, informally in the sense of just discussing with your peers what the topics were and how to, um, and like what everybody thought of it, what everybody's insight and take with, on it was. And that was actually very much facilitated both in class and outside of it, both by teachers during class, but also students outside of it in a casual setting. Um, but yeah, definitely, I would say like, I feel I, I wish I engaged more with it. And, uh, no worries. Thank you, Adam. Um, my experience is because I took some extracurriculars that I mentioned um, in within the UCL Innovation and Enterprise Department, um, the one that Onya mentioned that we have access to. Um, and also I, um, I was involved in sustainable UCL activities and also I joined the UCL Change Makers projects um, led by Onya, uh, sorry, not Onya, Mara, led by Mara. So I think that gave me a sense of collaboration working with diverse people, not only from the Pi cohort. Um, so I think if you really want to collaborate, that would, wouldn't be an issue because UCL is huge. We have societies, extracurriculars and many activities that one year wouldn't be enough for you to join all of that. Um, I wonder if anyone wants to add anything about this collaboration sense. I, I think you've got that covered, Amanda. That, that final point there is crucial as well. There really is such a wide variety here at UCL. Okay, I hope that answers the question. And um, the next question is from Ludmila Folokin Darosa. I'm sorry for if there's any mispronunciation. Um, she believes that um, the question would be better addressed to Dr. Onya Idoko. Uh, my name is Ludmila Folokin. I am from Brazil and I work as the head of public policy of the Brazilian Association for Startups, where I help entrepreneurs to innovate and improve the ecosystem. I am willing to study at UCL focusing on ESG policies that will ultimately lead to prosperity. Should I pursue the MSc at IGP or focus on UCL's MSc in data science and public policy? Actually, that's a tricky question because I don't know what that other program is about. I would say come to the IGP, <laughs> oh, I'm biased. But I, I, I cannot say what the other program is about. And as you've heard from Amanda and from Adam, um, there are various opportunities that we offer at the IGP. I would advise that you read about the other program and see what that offers. If it aligns with what it is that you intend to do after your, your, your studies, it will depend, to be honest. I I, I cannot compare. I, I have nothing to compare with because I don't know the other program. I, I'm just biased as it is, and I would say come to the IGP. So I'm I'm really sorry. I I can't sort of give you any more. Yeah, no worries. I think Dr. Ida can help to answer this because um, Ludmilla's interest is related to the ESG policies 
that would lead to prosperity in a sense that um I Ida, can you explain is whether PPP right for her? Sorry to say that again. I so Ludmila's interest um Ludmila works as the head of public policy of the Brazilian Association for Startups and she wants to help entrepreneurs to innovate and improve the ecosystem. And because the focus is on ESG policies, so I right. wonder if our program, PPB program, would be fit. I think it would actually work really well. So I'm um, I'm new to UCL, and I'm coming from a public policy school, actually. Um, and I see a lot of overlap that all the solutions and all the work that any of these programs do, they actually focus very much around policy and sort of looking at how policies can be different to promote solutions. Um, and so um, with PPP, we'll definitely talk about how environment and sort of the other aspects would come into that and how that would look within policy as well as business and sort of other aspects of society so i think policy is important um, but it can't ignore that there are also other actors that are making decisions and so um we will definitely um look at policy and look at environmental policy and look at um, how it all interacts um, with other decision makers. Hope that helps. Thank you, that explains. Um, so the next question would be for Francesca, I believe. Uh, my name is Deshanya Naido and I work, currently work at a nonprofit called Green Cape in South Africa. My, my question is, is it possible to apply for more than one program at the IGP? Uh, I believe it's possible to, to apply for two programs in total. Okay, so the maximum is two. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, it's also related to the IIPP. So the PI MSC is at the top of my list, and I wanted to find out if it's possible to take optional modules from IIPP. I would like to complement my study with some public policy and public purpose. I believe it's possible for you to take it as an elective. Okay, um, so next question is from Anwulika Okonjo. Hello, my name is Anwulika Okonjo. I'm social impact strategist and activist from Nigeria. Thank you for this informative question. My question is, can the dissertation for the PI program include a practical element like developing a project I'm not sure about developing a project. Maybe Onya can help to answer. So did the question end with developing a project? Yeah, can our dissertation um, include a practical project? I'm not sure what she means by practical project, but you can do, one of the things that we like is when you do an empirical study, right? So if you if you do something by collecting data empirically, so you go out and you generate that data firsthand, that is good. And like yourself, Amanda, you went back and you interviewed um, different actors within the the ecosystem back home. Yes, that is possible. But when she says when when the question the question says practical Developing. project, do you mean? it's focused on policy. I, I'm not sure what you mean. She meant developing a project, but um, but is that answering your question, Anulika? Just let us know. I think the dissertation itself has to, um, the, the word limit has to be met and there can't be a practical element that can be part of that. Is that correct, Anulika? So if, if it's if it's about so for example some students did work with an organization and that fed into um, so this is a, this is um, I can't remember the name of the organization they do social work that fed into their dissertation the work that they did with them but it is a research project you you have to actually conduct research it, it can't. It can't simply be practical only. So you do have, for example, pi is 15,000 words. 
you have to have that um if you're doing primary data re primary research you have to have collected that data you have to analyze that data you have to tell us about the methods so i'm going into detail of the dissertation but it has to follow that format in a way it, it's not something that you do something practical and then you come back and you're assessed that that's not sort of the way it works okay um i think she meant an empirical study or component so yeah i think then i've answered the question i suppose yes thank you so much um so the next question is from an anonymous attendee i'm a dual citizen british and pakistani if a is there any scholarship available for Pakistan only? Can I apply? Um, I think you can direct your question to Francesca um, and look for the list that Francesca has provided. Um, Francesca, do you have any comment? Um, yeah, if you go to the UCL scholarships finder, which where you can search, search all scholarships across UCL, um, there's a drop down menu for you to, cho uh, to choose a country of domicile. So you can actually choose the country where you're from and then it will come up with a list of scholarships that's open to students from that country um, so that's probably the best way uh, to search for that thank you and the next question it's probably directed to me and adam um so yeah i think we're just okay we're almost out of time so maybe just one more question what are the most important things to get across that you would like to see in a compelling personal statements um Kate, Oni, or Ida, do you want to take this question? I, th I think we'll, we'll maybe all feed into that, but um, it's an excellent question. The personal statement is really important. Um, what we want you, what we want to see is that you're committed to the IGP and that you're committed to engaging with the challenges that we've outlined and rethinking prosperity. So we really want to see how you've brought your qualifications and your work experience, your volunteering experience, your life experience to bear on those challenges and those questions. And then we get a sense not only of the fit, like, and not only whether or not you'll do well on the programme, but also what you can add to the community here at the, here at the IGP as well. So when you're thinking of writing the personal statement, you're speaking to, to me, Ida and Anya. Yeah. And that's what we want to hear. That's what we want to get a sense of is that this person understands what the aims of the Institute are. They understand what they, they will be engaging with and they can bring something as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that would be our last question. Um, I can direct back to you, Kate. Marvelous. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you everybody who presented. Um, and thank you for everyone who attended as well. Please do get in touch if you have any further queries. I think we answered the range there, but I'm sure there are some other queries that will come up. So if you email either the relevant um, admissions tutor or Francesca, then we should be able to get back to you. And yes, we look forward to reading your application. They're always very interesting. So thanks again for joining us. And yes, please do stay in touch.